supernatural. And then, like, like, hey, apparently a uh, guy in Seattle shot himself in the head three times. Maybe we should have missed it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm switching gear and talk about assembly language programming. For those of you who just got in here, we're going to talk about that. So I have to speak to you. Context please. Um, okay, so assembly language programming. Um, I put up a new homework assignment. Uh, I haven't set a date yet, so I have to set it first. But you already know what it is, and you know it is coming. So it should be no, no big surprise. Let me see, when did I hide? Nope, in the previous one. I cannot remember where I put my stuff. All right, so binary subtraction is the new homework assignment. It's a three bit by three bit uh, binary. Nope, that's not the one. Th there you go, three bit speedy subtractor, that's it. Um, so basically, it is exactly the same thing as the adder, except you're doing subtraction. That's the only difference. So instead of a carry function, you can call it a borrow function. I don't really care whether you call it a carry or the borrow function. Yep. Um, will the borrow, like, uh, <coughs> for the uh, table for this one, will the borrow be calculated at the same places in the table, or will the positions of the borrow shift? Uh, That's a good question. Okay. So what you want to do is to go back to that table, okay, the table of the reading material. So in this case, you know, we have all this stuff here. It's basically the same stuff. But what you want is to go back to the reading material, which, is, which only talks about binary adding. But a lot of that applies to subtraction. Yes, go ahead. The assignment's overdue by five days. Yes, I haven't changed the date yet. Well, I thought you already. <laughs> Some of us were actually looking online. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Too early to conclude. All right, so you're talking about this thing here, right? So what we want to do is to say that we are now doing subtraction. We are trying to do x, x minus y. Okay. So the question is, is the ordering of the parameters correct? That is the, that's, that's the question. So let me just double check. You guys can double check with me. First of all, the result of C minus F. That is correct, okay? The right order. And in this case, this is the result of, um, this one is incorrect, okay? But that's okay because in the end, we are subtracting the result of CF. We are subtracting zero from that. So the end result is just RCF, so that is correct. The, the actual result is correct. Next, we have BE here. Yes? But the carry back here, which would be the borrow, won't be zero because it, we have C equals zero and F equals one. So the borrow will have to borrow from somewhere. So the borrow there won't be zero because it has one. But the answer is still one. Which one? Um, where the, the carry is, all the way to the end, under C and F. You mean this part here? No, all the way to the, to the right hand. Uh, C, yeah. The that zero? Is zero. It is a zero because this is the borrow that a non-existent column is borrowing from this column. Okay. Now let's let's consider c equals zero and f equals one. So okay. zero minus one, we will have to borrow. Yes, but that borrow goes here. Oh, it goes here. That goes here, and that one is correct. Okay. This is the borrow of c minus f. So this is the right order. And this is the this is the result of B minus D, that is the right one. So I'm just double checking the orders here. This is the result of REE minus CCF, so this is the right order as well. Uh, here we have the result of A minus D, that's correct. This is um, the carry or the borrow of B minus D, that's the right order. This junction, the order does not matter anyway. This is the borrow of the second subtraction, which is RBE minus CCF, so it is the, the right order. The result here, is that the right order? It, is, it should be um, RAE minus, um, minus this mess here, so it is the right order. And then get, getting to the last one, 
preparing for the borrow of A minus D. This is the first way to set this borrow flag. The second way to set this borrow flag is this bit minus this bit here. That is going here. This part is going there. So the order is all correct. In other words, if you turn all of these uh, C functions to the borrow function, it is exactly the same structure. Did you guys see how I just verified to make sure that the order is correct? Because in addition, it doesn't matter because it's copy and paste, but subtraction is not. So that's why I need to make sure that the order is correct, that I specify the first and the second argument in the correct way. Are there any questions about this table and how it applies to subtraction? No questions? Okay. And then the only thing that is a little bit tricky about subtraction is when we define addition, the carry flag is just, um, the carry flag of N, A, and B is just A, B, or the conjunction of A, B. That's for addition. When you have subtraction, A minus B is gonna be not A and B. So when A is a zero, B is a one, and then it results in a ball. But this negation can make things a little bit complicated because A may not be a simple variable. So when A is not a simple variable and you're negating it, that means you have to apply the Morgan's law. Because the, 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 the application of the Morgan's law is to push the negation all the way in until it is applied to individual variables. So that's the only complication when you're dealing with subtraction. Are there any questions about the new homework assignment, the three-bit speedy subtraction? Yep. How does it work if you're subtracting a bigger number from a smaller number? It's okay, the final borrow will just be set. Okay. okay. We can do an example by hand, go ahead. <laughs> Give me an example. Um, I don't know, I was just thinking like- Zero minus minus seven. Eight. Minus eight. Well, those are not exactly three bit numbers, but two minus eight. Oops. Four bit numbers. Zero minus zero is a zero. There is a implied zero here because we don't have any less significant columns. Zero minus zero is a zero. Is that okay? So this entire row of borrows, they're all borrow rates. One minus zero is a one, does not yield any borrow of one. One minus zero is a one. So we can look at so far. Zero minus zero is a zero. Since no one, this subtraction does not yield a borrow, this subtraction doesn't yield a borrow, so I end up with no borrow at all. Zero minus zero is zero. Zero minus one is a one, with a borrow. One minus zero is a one. So the answer to this particular subtraction is one zero one zero with an extra borrow at the end. Yep. Are we supposed to uh, indicate whether it's a negative number or positive? There's no need to deal with negative or positive because we only use zeros or ones. So there's no quote unquote negative to talk about. Does that make any sense? <coughs> yeah, it would. It's just, um, you know, there'd be like a certain point where it would start to uh, go over to the negative side, and I, th and I thought that's when the. There's no negative the borrow, side. That's when the borrow would actually pop up. Because there's, there's no negative side because when we, when we talk about the borrow function, we have 0 minus 0 having no borrow, 1 minus 0 having no borrow, 1 minus 1 having no borrow. The only one case that you think is going to be negative. Also, it's not negative. Zero it's minus it's one, one has one bar has a borrow of one. That's it. So we don't talk about sign at all in this particular case. Okay. There's no sign to deal with. Yep. Um, two minus eight. Okay, that's a good question. So let me rephrase your question. How do we know this is representing negative six? Yeah. All right, let's, let's talk about that. 
Now we have jumped in a little bit up ahead of time because we are not you know, we are not quite at the point to talk about signs and numbers yet. But since you asked the question, I think this is the right context at least to give you an exposure of it. <coughs> number circle. We don't have a number line because everything wraps around. Okay? So when you're dealing with a four bit number, we have a you know, 16 of these points, right? Because two to the power of four is 16. So we have 16 actual distinct binary bit patterns. Is that okay? This one is zero, 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 zero. Is that okay? So zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. I, I want to fill up this table because you know, then it makes sense. Uh, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. Is that okay? <coughs> Whenever you subtract, you are going in this direction. Whenever you add, you go in this direction. Is that okay? Now you go, you start from zero, and you count how many times you have to take counterclockwise to get to the bit pattern that we see on the board. One, two, three, four, five, ding, six. So that's one way to look at it. So this can be seen as the value negative six. On the other hand, if you're not dealing with signed numbers, you can also look at this bit pattern as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So it is both in a way. So we'll talk about the duality of, you know, okay, but is this bit pattern representing a negative value or is it representing a non-negative value? We'll deal with that later. Okay? But it, it, it's, it kind of makes sense here, right? Yep. It's like the two's complement. Yes, that's what two's complement comes in again. Are there, yep, go ahead. Is your mic on? Line this mic is not on. Now it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions? But it's still recorded, it's just not you know, as clear. All right, so if there are no questions, we're gonna move on with the notes, and I got something new for you guys for this semester. So you guys are special. I get to say that every semester. Well, that's the whole thing. I really like, you know, um, adding uh, additional notes to my stuff here. Okay, we talked about the RAM module, and I have to remember where I put it. Registers. <coughs> ah, okay, I put it all the way here. This one is kind of interesting. Oops. Three people have done it already. Good job. Whoever tried, you know, good job. All right. So we are going to go talk about memory. Do you guys still remember we talked about memory last time? Mm -hmm. You know, the memory has an address bus, has a data bus, and stuff like that. So the basic question is, the most core question is, how does a computer remember something? How does memory work at the lowest level? Because we already know the computer consists of nothing, nothing but transistors, okay? And we can make logic gates out of transistors. <coughs> That's what we took away from the very first class. So now the question is, well, using only logic gates, how do we create the, so the concept of memory? In other words, it can hold a particular bit path until time when the processor says, Okay, change your bit pack. I want you to store a one instead of whatever you have before. Okay, so we want to explore that mechanism in today's class. Okay, this is what we're going to talk about. The most logic gates do not have memory. In other words, if you look at the AND gate, the output of an AND gate will change instantaneously when the input changes. When you look at the OR gate, it's the same thing. If you look at your um, three bit by three bit, uh, three bit by three bit adder, it's the same thing. The moment you change the number as an input, the output after a certain number of delay 
a certain amount of delay, it will change. In other words, they do not hold a particular value at all. But we still do okay so far with that concept. But at this point, we don't have the concept of memory. In other words, we cannot remember something. As soon as the input changes, the output will change as well. So what we want is to have something that can retain the output, retain its own state until you tell it to change. And some really smart person came up with this design here. This design is really simple, okay? It consists of only two NAND gates. We know these are NAND gates because the little bubble here is a negation, and then this part here is a AND gate. So when you combine these, it becomes a negated AND gate, which is also known as a NAND gate. We talked about how to use transistors to make NAND gates in the first class, okay? So how can something like this symbol be used to remember something? This is the lowest level of memory units. It's called an SR latch, okay? It is a latch. And the first thing you probably notice is unlike the other types of gates that we have talked about, the other types of constructs that we have talked about, this one looks like a loop because the output of one NAND gate becomes one input to the other one, and opposite is true as well. The output of the second NAND gate becomes one of the input of the first NAND gate. That is the mechanism that makes it possible to remember something. But how do we analyze this? We can no longer analyze something like this using a truth table, not conventionally using a conventional truth table. So what we want to do is to look at it you know, in a slightly different way. The question here, you know, which I'm not going to answer, is does this configuration end up with a fight where two outputs can specify different values to the same wire? Okay? In other words, the output of this versus the output of this, do they both go to the same wire? And you just have to track it down. You know, there's no, no mysterious or tricky part to this question. All right, so now we take a closer look at the SR latch. This is called an SR latch. S for set, R for reset. Okay, so it's a set, reset, latch. And I start to label the pins. Okay, A, B are the inputs, X, Y are the outputs. We doing okay so far with this? The equations are kind of cyclic. You know, x is you know a y bar, okay, because it takes the input a and it also takes um, the output y and do the end and then negate the output of the end. Same thing with the other one. But this is the whole point. This is why it works. So what we did or what I did is to examine the various you know possibilities. So let's examine x equals to um, a, y, and with bar on top of that. Regardless of y, if input a is 0, x becomes a 1. Okay, so let's just take a look at the picture here. And we are considering the case when a is 0. So with a, with a being 0, what is 0 and whatever? 0 and whatever is 0 and not zero is <coughs> one. So that means if A is a zero, which one is guaranteed, which output is guaranteed to be a one? X is guaranteed to be a one. Okay, so let's say X is a one now. And I change A back to a one. What's gonna happen? Let me, let me say that one more time. And instead of just saying it, I'm going to use a uh, mouse pad so that we can actually just describe what I think is going to happen. Okay. So the first thing that I said was um, A is 0. Well, if A is 0, it leads to A, um, it leads to X being 1. Does that make any sense? Oh, but what about the other input pin of the NAND gate? What about Y? Does it even matter whether Y is 0 or 1? It doesn't matter because it is a NAND gate, and as soon as one input is a 0, the output is guaranteed to be a 1. Okay? So we know that X is a 1 in this case. When X is a 1, 
what will happen instead. So if x is 1, this 1 goes in here. And assuming b is also a 1, okay, so assume b is a 1, okay. That means y is going to be y is going to be a zero. Okay, so this will this is the state. The input the input state is a is zero, b is one. The result is x being a one and y being a zero. Are we doing okay so far with the first state? So now we say okay, let's change a from zero back to a one. So now we change a back to a one. So a being a one. But everything else will keep uh, will keep B the same. Okay, um, how will that impact X? Will it impact X? Sorry, because wait, wait, wait. okay, hold on. I'm not changing B. I'm only changing A. B is continuing to be a one. I'm just changing A. A goes from zero back to a one. The question is, by changing A from 0 to a 1, am I making any changes to the upper pins? I'm not making any changes to the upper pins because from X perspective, <coughs> Y is a 0. Y is a 0. This is a 0. It goes back to this input pin here. And at least, if at least one input is a 0, X is going to be a 1. So X will continue to be a 1, even though one of the input pins, A, input pin A, has gone from 0 to 1. Is that okay? But this is not something that we have observed up to this point. Because all the gate combinations that we have seen up to this point will immediately change the output depending on the state of the input, the state of the input. This one doesn't seem to do that. Because at this point, I can flip A between a 0 and a 1 all day long, and none of the output pins would actually change. Is that OK? All right. So if this is OK, let's go ahead and see what's going to happen when I turn B into a 0. Okay. So we'll just say that no output. Okay. I'll just say x equals 1, y equals 0. Nothing changes. Now we change B to a 0. Keep A the same, we change, it, uh, we change B. What's going to happen? When B is changed to a 0, then one pin is going to be changed right away. The output of the NAND gate that B connects to is going to change immediately to a Y becomes a 1. Okay? But Y becomes a 1 and A is still a 1. Okay? So this will further lead to another change and who's going to change next? X is going to change to a 0. Exactly. What if I change B back to a 1? Will anything happen? Think about it. I change B back to a 1, but one of the input of this NAND gate is coming from X. X is already down to 0, so the output of this pin will continue to be a 1. Y gets to keep its value of 1. What about X? This is x. This pin is uh, going to y. y is a 1, so 1 input is a 1 already. a is continuing to be a 1, so we have 1 and 1, which means the output is going to be a 0. x gets to keep its own state of 0. This is why it is called a latch. Because at this point, Okay, you know, after line nine of this you know, of this uh, editor, I can keep flipping bit B, you know, from one to zero back to one. It, there won't be any changes to the output state. So, from observing this, can someone say anything about mm, if I specify X as the actual output of this thing? How would you label the input? Which one is going to set x to be a 1, and which one is going to reset x to be a 0? A sets, B resets. That is correct. So that's why pin A is also known as S, 
and then pin B is also known as R. Are we doing okay so far with this concept of a latch? The idea is once you change the state of the output, with one of the pins, we can flip it all day long and it's not going to do a single thing. In real life, we also have these latches. Um, I will just use a, a an example. Yes. Here, yes. Okay. So let's say you know on this remote control there are two buttons. One button says on. The other button says off. Okay. Once the projector is on, if I keep hitting the on button, what's going to happen? <coughs> Nothing, because it's already quote unquote latched to the on state. But if I press the off button, it will change the state of the projector, it will turn it off, right? Once it is off, what happens when I keep hitting the off button? Nothing, because it's already off. So with a latch, basically you have one pin that is responsible to turn it on, and one pin that is responsible to turn it off. But once it is on, keep hitting the on button doesn't do a single thing. Once it is off, hitting the off button all the again and again doesn't do a single thing. And that is why it is called a latch, because it is latched, a latched state. Is that okay? Sort of. Okay. And this is this turns out to be the most basic unit for memory to remember something in a computer. And the rest of this, you know, is just a text version of all the things that I explained. And I try to use a truth table to do the same thing. Um, basically, when you when you have a B transition to zero, then uh, Y becomes a one, and X becomes a zero. When one when you have one one, the only thing you know, okay, when A and B are both ones, the only thing that is guaranteed is X is the negation of Y, and Y is the negation of X. That is the only thing you know. But which one is a one and which one is a zero? You don't. You don't know about that one just know that the negations of each other. It's only when you turn one of the inputs, A or B, into a zero, then you are trying to make a change. The third state, which is having a zero and a zero, it doesn't make any sense, okay? Because in this case, X and Y will both turn into a one, which is not a desirable state. And this part explains why we use the SR, because um, pin X is usually known as Q, which is the actual output of a latch. You know, is it on or is it off? Y is known as the negation of Q, which is the, uh, the opposite state of Q. Okay, next slide. So the bottom line of the first paragraph is an SR latch is useful, but it does have certain problems or certain limitations. There's no guarantee that we do not end up with S and R being zero. The both input pins are zeros, okay? There's no guarantee because they are outside of the gate systems. That's one problem. The second problem is the latch will change the state as soon as the one of the inputs go to zero. In other words, it is, this is what we call a level sensitive circuit, not edge sensitive circuit. Um, in a logic circuit with other components, it is really helpful to have a gated input where a single pin can determine whether the memory component can change state or not, and then use the other pin to control which state you want to change it to. Okay, let me just rephrase this, okay? I want to have one pin to say, can I change state? and then another pin to say, which state do you want me to change to? Instead of having one pin to say turn on and the other pin to say turn off. Is that okay? Hold up. Okay. So how do we use the existing circuit that we have already into a design where you can specify enable, okay? You know, if I'm enabled, I can change state, then I will change to whatever the input state is this is the design. 
Okay, so let's look at this one here. Does everybody recognize a built-in uh, SR latch in this design? Mm -hmm. Where is it? Yeah. Left or right? The right. The right hand side. Very good. So the right hand side is our uh, SR latch. This part here. <coughs> what is to the left hand side is basically you know additional <coughs> logic to do whatever to to do what I said earlier. Okay. Let's take a look at what this says. D is the data bit. Okay. In other words, D is quote unquote the desirable state of the SR latch. Okay. If D is a one, I want to turn on X. If D is a zero, I want to turn off X. Why is not really that important? Why is usually not even an output pin? You know, but normally, it is not even an output. It's just an internal state. But in this case, I just want to state it so that sometimes I can refer to that signal. This pin here is called CLK. It really should be called enable, or EN, or just E. It is the enable bit. Okay. What happens when CLK is a zero? Well, that's oh, it. Exactly. So if CLK is a zero, then it goes. It will turn on both of these bits. And what is the result of turning on those bits? The both the S pin and the R pin to the SR latch will then both be ones. Uh, what does that do to the L SR latch? Absolutely nothing, right? When the when the input pins of when both input pins to an SR latch are ones, there won't be any changes to the state of the latch, which is what I want, because I want this clock so-called you know, clock pin to be enable pin. So if the enable pin is zero, the SR latch is quote unquote not enabled, and will it pay any attention to D? doesn't pay any attention to D, which is great, okay? Because now, the reason why we like circuits like this is because this wire that connects to the D pin of this particular, what we call a D flip-flop, can also be connected to a bunch of other flip-flops. So by controlling which flip-flop is enabled, I can now just say, okay, even though I am you know, putting a new state of one on the on the wire on the D wire, by controlling which D flip flop has CLK being a one, I can still specify who is going to update, and the rest just don't do anything. Do not pay attention. Don't change your state. I mean, do okay so far with the rationale of this circuit, not just the behavior, but why this is important. What if CLK is a one? Okay, if CLK is a one, then the only thing that can determine the output pins of these two NAND gates is going to be the D pin. But when you look at the D pin, it connects to the two NAND gates slightly differently. It connects to the top NAND gate without negation. It connects to the bottom NAND gate with a negation. So what it does, what, the, what this particular negation does, is to make sure that if the top output is a one, the bottom one is going to be a zero. If the bottom one is a one, the top one is going to be a zero. So this way, I can either set X or I can reset X, but I won't be doing both at the same time. So this little circuit here, by adding two additional NAND gates, I can now accomplish what I said a little bit earlier. First of all, I make it a gated circuit by using the clock pin, and then two, instead of using one pin to turn it on, another pin to turn it off, I use one single pin to specify a new state. Are we still doing okay so far with a D flip-flop? This is called a D flip-flop circuit. So the rest of this is really just the text explanation of the same thing. But the, the, the flip-flop circuit, let me just go back to the D flip-flop circuit here. <coughs> okay, this D flip-flop circuit still has one little issue. The CLK input is level sensitive. What does that mean? It means as long as CLK is a one, okay, 
if you change D, it will change the output states. Let me say that one more time. As long as CLK remains as a one, if you make changes to the D pin, the output pin XY will change. Is that okay? But sometimes we don't want that either. Sometimes we want it to be edge sensitive, which means it will only make changes when the clock pin has an upper, has a rising edge, when it changes from zero to one, and then it will just hold the state. Because this way we can multiplex the wires even more effectively. In other words, we can simplify the circuit of your processor even further. So that's why you know, we, in the next slide, we will talk about a D flip flop that is edge sensitive, not level sensitive. Are there any questions at this point? You know, including the terms of what is edge sensitive, what, what is level sensitive, that sort of thing. Questions? Okay, do you guys have any questions for me? No? Okay. All right, so moving on to the next slide. The next slide is a little bit more complicated, but it starts off with the explanation of a level sensitive D flip flop is useful, but has limitations. <clears throat> if memory is to be retained, then the data input cannot change as long as the en enable pin is asserted because it is level sensitive. This is a limitation because the data input of a flip flop can be shared with other components. The wire containing, connecting to this data input cannot be changed for other components that are also connected as long as the input pin is asserted. So we want to turn this into edge sensitive. The bottom line is to make level sensitive D flip flop work with other components, additional clock cycles has to, they must be introduced. Okay, because we only want one thing to be updated at in one clock cycle. So in one clock cycle we say, hey, you pay attention to the D, pin, D bus, or the D wire, and then in the next clock cycle you say, okay, you shut up, and then you pay attention, and so on. Which is really kind of time consuming because only one thing can work for each clock cycle. If we make it edge sensitive, then we have a better way to make use of the bus or make use of the wires. This is the, the design that makes it edge sensitive. Okay. This one looks a little funky. It looks like there are three SR latches, sort of, right? There's one, the one to the right hand side is pretty clear. But you can kind of see one up here, okay? The upper left hand side. And there's one kind of here, except you know, this particular NAND gate has three inputs instead of two. But otherwise, you can still see the, the, uh, the crossing of the wires. You can see this wire goes into here, this wire goes into here. So this is still kind of a, a, an SR latch, except it has three inputs, because the third one comes from here. All right, so we want to look at the behavior of this particular circuit and go like, okay, what, how is this special? And I think it might be helpful to <coughs> open this slide in a new tab. why I'm doing this is because I think maybe we need to look at both at the same time. <coughs> so we'll go ahead and this new window. Scroll to the point that I want to make here. Okay. And sort of works. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is to examine what happens when the clock is zero. Okay, so I'm just going to go to the slide here and just point out to what happens when the clock is zero. This pin is a zero. <coughs> okay, what is the immediate result of CLK being zero? 
CLK is fed into the third gate from the top and also the second gate from the top directly. So that would immediately turn this one to a one, turn that one to a one. Does that make any sense? Regardless of the other input pins, because this is a NAND gate, if at least one input is a zero, the output is guaranteed to be a one. Is that okay? So that's what it says here, okay? When CLK is a zero, um, slash S and slash R will turn into one. You know, that's how I label these two wires. This, this wire is labeled slash R, or you know, it's an active low signal for resetting. This is slash S, which is uh, active low for setting the flip flop, I mean the, the latch. Okay. So that means you know, when the clock is a zero, it doesn't matter what we do with D. Okay, D can go crazy and flip flop, you know, you can turn on and turn off all day long, then but still nothing is gonna happen to the latch to the right hand side. Does that make any sense? So as long as clock is zero, nothing happens to the latch. It maintains its state. Attack, this is what we had in the previous diagram too. That is correct. Okay. Um, what if D is zero? When clock is zero? Let's, let's find out. This is the D pin and the clock pin is a zero. So the D pin is going to be, if the D pin is also a zero, R is going to be a one guaranteed. When R is a one guaranteed, um, we also know that S is going to be a zero. Because when R is a zero, excuse me, when R is a one, it goes through this to here to slash R. And let's see. Oh, okay. I take it back, I followed the wrong line. It goes through this junction, okay? This becomes R, it becomes a one. This one is not going to change state because it is also connected to the clock. Clock being zero means this is going to output a one. What I'm curious is what's going to happen to this guy. Okay. R is a one. It goes all the way up to here. So this input is going to be a one. What about this one here? Where do we see that? Where do we get that one? We get that one out of this guy. And what did we say about this guy here? It's also a one. So we have a one and a one, so the S wire is now guaranteed to be a zero. Okay, so that's why you know, we have these conclusions here. That the clock is low and D is zero. We know that S, we know that R is gonna be one, S is gonna be a zero. S will come in handy. At this point, it doesn't serve any purpose. It doesn't do a single thing to the S R latch on the right hand side. But it is important later on because when CLK by the clock line becomes a one, then it becomes useful. So that's why we still want to track the states of R and S. Not slash R, not slash S, just R and S. But we doing okay so far with the analysis up to this point. Um, but what if uh, when CLK is a zero, what if D is a one? Well, let's take a look. If when CLK is a zero and D is a one, D is a one here. So that means this side is a one. And what about the other side? Okay, where, where do we get this? We get this out of slash R. Slash R is already guaranteed to be a one because clock is a zero. So that means the output of R is guaranteed to be a zero. But because R is zero, where does R go? R goes all the way to the input of S. So when R is zero, S is guaranteed to be a one. Is that okay? All right, so keep that in mind. <coughs> now let's see what happens when CLK goes from zero to one. So this is the rising edge that is going to click mix changes. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. All right. So when D is zero and we have a zero to one transition, then this is going to happen. <coughs> okay. You can follow the logic, you know, read it, you know, on your own, but you can follow all of these things. But be because S, C, L, K, and R are all ones, slash R is going to be a zero. Now, because slash R becomes a zero, R is now latched to a one, regardless of the D pin due to the nature of the NAND gate. 
This is important. Okay. The mechanical the, the mechanics of this is kind of important by following the state of the gate, but the conclusion is also important because this is the whole reason. Okay, let me just read this part again. Because slash r is zero, which is just a mechanical aspect of that, r is now latched to a one. Regardless, now the key point here is regardless of d due to the nature of the NAND gate. Okay, that is the key to this. Which means once we make the transition of the clock from zero to a one, the D pin is useless at this point. It doesn't affect the right hand side SR latch anymore. Which is what we want, because we only want the transition itself to effect change. We don't want this to be level sensitive like the previous design. Is that okay? All right. So the next line basically repeats what I just said. Any further changes of D make no further gate transitions whatsoever. So that means you know we have successfully implemented implemented the the edge sensitive nature of this D flip flop. What about the other one? What if when we make a transition from clock zero to clock one, D is a one? Because S is a one, and now C, now K is a one, slash S is going to be a zero. Okay? So once slash S becomes a zero, um, if D changes to zero, R becomes a one, okay? Because when D is a zero, this becomes a one. But that no longer changes S uh, slash R equal to zero anymore, because slash R is going to be latched <coughs> to zero, because slash S is also feeding to the NAND gate that outputs to slash r, slash s equals to zero, guarantees slash r due to the nature of a NAND gate. And then we follow the same logic and say that the s pin also does not do any changes any further, which also means at this point, the output s slash r and s of all the NAND gates the r directly feeds to will not change. And as a result of that, you can change D as much as you want to. It's not going to do anything to the latch to the right hand side. Once again, the mechanical part is kind of, there's a lot of stuff to follow, okay? You can do that once or twice, okay? That is not the important part. The important part to take away is once we make a transition of the clock pin going from zero to one, it will make a stage change to the latch to the right hand side. But once you have made a change, you can change D all you want, even when the clock pin is a high. It won't do a single thing to the SR latch to the right-hand side anymore. Are we doing okay so far with that concept? Okay. And because you know, slash S and slash R are guaranteed not to change any further because of the reasoning listed here, if, S, if slash R is not changing, slash R is not changing, the SR latch on the right hand side is not going to change. Are we doing okay so far with this logic here? Yes, sort of. I think this is the last one. Yep, it is the last one. All right. So let me close this one because we don't need a standalone window. And we'll go back to this part here. So what have we talked about? Why is this stuff important? This is one bit only. You know, what is the big deal of one bit? Exactly. Then we have registers. Okay, we have multi-bit things that can store multiple bits at the same time. Okay? And then we have memory. This is actually the, the lowest level of you know, how memory is, is um, implemented. Are we doing okay so far with the concept of an SR latch, a level sensitive D flip flop, and then the last one is called a edge sensitive D flip flop? Those concepts are okay? So even though I only show you how to deal with one bit, 
um, can we use, can we modify this design to deal with multiple bits? Yep. You basically replicate everything, but they will share the same clock. That's it, okay? You just have to replicate this design multiple times, they share the same clock, they become what we call a register. Any questions about this? Questions? Nobody seems to be impressed by how ingenious you know, the latch or the flip-flops are. You guys are not impressed. I personally was impressed, okay? You know, for the longest time, I have no idea how a computer can maintain its memory. It's like, how does it do that? Okay, using only transistors. This is how. When I read this, I was actually thoroughly impressed. It's like, wow, that is really smart. You know, I can never really come up with something like that. <laughs> All right, so this out of the way, we can now move on. So this is just your reading material. Once again, you know, it looks like a quiz, but it doesn't really count for any points for your final grade, so don't worry about it from the perspective of grading. But you still want to make sure that you understand the concepts. Okay. All right. So let's go back to volume machines and see to make sure that I've covered everything that I need to cover. So we talked about memory access you know, last time. Oh, thank you, I almost forgot. And we still got time. When I look at my watch, it didn't update the time. It only showed like 7.03. Go like, no, it cannot be 7.03. It doesn't feel that way. It doesn't feel that way. It doesn't feel like three minutes into the class. Not quite. Time compression, but you know, not that much. OK. So this slide talks about, um, or this particular section talks about the control unit. It, it is a big section. Um, it talks about registers. I'm not even sure whether the link works or not. No, it does not. Okay, I forgot to fix these things. Um, let me fix it first, and then we'll talk about it. <coughs> the server that hosted all of this stuff here died um, in the winter break. And I already have everything moved to the Moodle server, but I haven't updated all the links yet. So this will... What was the cause of death? Um, hard drive failure. And nobody wants to pay for replacement hard drives. <coughs> you can call it lack of funding. All right, story of registers. Okay, I don't have to read it. It's going to be super boring to read it. All right. So the concept is, okay, we all remember how to access memory, do we? Okay, you have the address bus <laughs> to specify which location you want to address, and what you want to access. You have to control the control pins. Is this a read operation? Is it a write operation? And then the processor has to either, either present the data onto the data bus if it's a write operation, or it has to sample the data bus if it's a read operation. So all of those steps, take they take time. Each step takes you know, a certain amount of time. So it's not really that inexpensive to access memory. To get one byte, to read one byte or read one word from memory is time consuming. So here's the other question. How fast can the processor compute? Like add numbers and stuff like that. Very fast. Really fast because, it, because we know how to do the speedy version of the app, right? Okay? But that's the reason, okay? We want the processor to be able to compute as quickly as possible. How do you store the, the result of all that computation? For all that numbers. Okay, well, before we talk about registers. Oh, well, we can store that into memory, right? 
Okay, so you can store all that stuff into memory, but each time you want to store something into memory, what do you have to do? Specify the address, specify the data bus, you have to wait a little bit because you know, it takes time for all that you know code changes to settle down and also for the memory module to internally work its magic until the right location is addressed, right? So it all takes time, and that's only to store one value into memory. Are we doing okay so far? The main problem of memory is it has to be addressed. That's, for, that's the first problem. The second problem is physically, how far is it from the processor? Nah, it's not that far, it's on the same motherboard. Okay? Okay, on the same motherboard, what is the distance between the processor and the memory module? A few inches, okay? A few inches from your perspective, because you're looking at it from point to point. But when you, when you follow those really fine wires on the circuit board, it's not really a few inches because they have to go around and do stuff like that, okay? What does a wire do to a signal? Okay, I'll give you a picture that you guys can, especially for those of you who have taken electrical, or the physics class that talks about electrical stuff, okay? Tell me what this is gonna do. I have a wire, okay? Just a wire, okay. copper. On one end, I inject a square wave like this. On the other end, what am I going? What am I going to get? A little shorter one. A little Not bit. shorter. Okay. Most software people, including myself, is going to say the same thing. This is a conductor, right? You know, the conductor will just conduct. If you inject a signal like this on one side, you will get the same thing on the other side. Well, maybe there's a little bit delay because of um, the speed of electrons going through a conductor, right? Okay, what do you learn in your physics class for those of you who have learned electromagnetics? What have you learned? Okay, sorry? I don't know, I don't, num I don't do numbers. <laughs> okay, I cannot remember. Is it the right hand rule or the left hand rule? Okay, one of those two. Okay, because we only got two hands. We have current. Okay, very small, but nonetheless, some current going from here to here. And what does current do in terms of electromagnetics? It creates, it in, induces a magnetic field, right? So depending on whether it's the right hand rule or left hand rule, it's either going this way or the other way around. It doesn't matter to me, okay? But the point is, it takes time, okay? It takes time for the magnetic field to be established. Inductance is a flywheel. What does a flywheel do? What is a flywheel? Um, that's the, like, you're talking about a car? Yeah, talk about cars. Okay, so you have like a, a pressure plate over there that the clutch okay. compresses into. And is that part of the transmission? Yeah, yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's on the engine, actually, the flywheel. It's on the engine, but yeah. what happens when you don't have a flywheel? Well, it's not going to connect with the transmission, so it's not even going to spin. Well, but even not talking about that. Yep, go ahead. It won't be smooth anymore. No. It won't be smooth anymore because the flywheel is what is carrying the momentum. So that when you when you're between the power strokes, the flywheel is what makes your cylinder go up and down and operate the valves and whatnot. Without the flywheel, you don't have that momentum. So you have your combustion cycle, and then that's it. It stops because the energy that you um, convert from the combustion cycle is used is used up instantaneously and then nothing else happens because there's no momentum to carry that energy around and turn your engine okay so it is basically it's just like trying to move a heavy object that is on a, a surface that has no resistance that has no uh, friction okay so at first it's hard to push that thing right 
because it's a heavy object. But once you get it going, it doesn't take much effort to keep it going because your, your floor or the surface has no friction. But then it takes a lot of effort to get it to stop for the same reason, because of its momentum. Magnetic field is the same thing. So that means even though you want this thing to have a square wave, which means I want to change the voltage from 0 to 1.8 or whatever instantaneously, it cannot happen instantaneously because you have a flywheel to overcome. So that means <coughs> when you get out, when you get it out from the other side, it's going to look like this. It's a curve. Okay. Um, what about the fallen edge here? I want it to stop right away. It cannot stop right away. It keeps going. Okay? So that means on this side, it's going to dip below zero a little bit, and then it will recover. This is what we call a shark fin, because it looks like this. But what does that have anything to do with what we are talking about? The longer the wire, the the more pronounced this particular effect. How far is memory again? The memory modules, the DIMMs, from the processor. A few inches. What about the registers? What about the other components inside the processor? Millimeters, right? So when you have memory modules being outside of the processor, this becomes the issue. You cannot just say, oh, I have made changes to the address bus. I'm assuming the, pro the, the memory module is getting it right away. Nope, it has to wait. Because it has to wait for this much time before the voltage is stabilized. Are we doing OK so far? The actual physics is not important. The important part is there is a delay between the processor making a change on a single wire to the time that you can reliably read that line or read that wire on the other side and say, is that a one or is it a zero? During this time, don't even ask, okay? Because it is in transition. It's only after this much delay or latency, then you can say, okay, now I'm going to sample this wire here. So every time you want to transmit something, something is to change from the processor to anything that is outside of the processor on the circuit board, this comes into play. But why is that important? It slows down. It slows it's down. It's down. Exactly. Because this is actually a significant amount of time. Okay? So if I were to give you an analogy of what it is like for a really fast processor, like the i i7 processor, what it has to do to in order to store something into memory is kind of like this, okay? I'm the processor, I have a calculator. I have a, you know, possibly a dumb calculator, so you can give me two numbers to add, I can give you the sum right away, really quick, just like you know, what I can do here. But I want to store something, it's kind of like asking one of you, give you a slip of paper and say, I want you to store this number. Okay, you want me to store it where? Not in your notebook? not in your backpack. It's a notebook that is somewhere in the library. <laughs> uh, second floor in the library, you know, you know, six shelves down, and you know, the, the, the 20th you know, notebook, I want you to store this value over there. So what do you do? Right out of the classroom, go to the library, finish everything, then you come back. During all that time, what am I doing? Waiting. Twiddling my thumbs. That's what the process is going to do. Every time you store something into memory, that is the amount of time that it takes to store something into, ex into memory that is external to the processor. Do we see a problem here? Yeah. Your i7 processor will run really, really slow. Not because it cannot compute you know, the number, it cannot crunch the numbers. It can crunch the numbers just fine. It cannot store or fetch the numbers quickly enough. That is the problem. But we cannot live without memory because we got gigabytes and gigabytes of memory. So what is the solution to this problem? Solid state. Solid state? That's even slower. 
A buffer? Registers, okay? Registers. What exactly are registers? Okay, what is it? What do you think a 8-bit register looks like? It has to relate to something that we talked about already today. So <coughs> the XRs matches? Exactly. Okay, so if you look at one D flip-flop, your edge sensitive flip-flop as this, okay? It has one single output, has one D out input, and has a clock, right? That's a <coughs> simplification of a edge sensitive edge sensitive D flip-flop. What if I were to string like a bunch of these things together? <coughs> Five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so let's say we have 64 of these things. Okay, so I'll just say 64 of these things. Okay, so now we have 64 bits as output, and we have 64 bits as input, but they all share the same clock. Down here, what do we end up with? A register. So a register is kind of really just like a whole bunch of D flip flops connected. They do not share the D line, but they do share the clock line. But together, this construct can now store 64 bit numbers. And it's edge sensitive. Are we doing okay so far? This is not really complicated. I can put this right next to the ALU on the same die. What is the distance between the ALU and the register? In millimeters. Which means this becomes more like that. Registers can keep up with the ALU. It can keep up with the calculator. In other words, it's almost like you know, having little post-its all over my you know, area here. I finished calculation. I don't need you guys to take it all the way to the library. I just jot down a number here. That's the kind of scale that we are talking about. Probably exaggerated a little bit, but same kind of idea. Because I don't need you to get out of the classroom. You don't have to run to the library. Yes, it takes me a little bit of time to write it down, but not, it's not a whole lot of time. So we want, we like registers because they are fast, they can keep up with this really speedy adder that you have implemented, okay? So why don't we just use registers? If they're so fast, if they're so great, we can just use all registers. Forget about memory. We don't want to do anything off chip, put everything on chip. What is the problem with that approach? You're probably gonna have to make bigger products. There's not enough space, exactly. Even though a transistor is only 18 nanometers, you know, width and height, we still cannot implement, we cannot have eight gigs of RAM on the same chip. It's just not possible. Physically, it is just not possible, okay? So the number of registers we can actually have on the processor is limited. There are two factors limiting how many registers we can actually use on the processor. The first one, obviously, is a physical limitation. How big is the die? How many transistors these uh, registers require to implement? That's one limiting factor. What do you think is the second or the more important limiting factor? Oh. Heat. Hmm? Uh, heat. Heat is not that big of an issue. Okay. Cost? Cost? Mm, not too bad. Cost is not the main issue. Complexity. Hmm? Complexity. Well, as transistors you know, shrink, you know, we end up with more possibility to pack more transistors, but we cannot do that. We, even though we can pack more transistors, we cannot change the number of registers. It's because of the instruction set. Okay. What is what is the instruction set? What is an instruction to the processor? What does it look like? Uh, it's a bunch of zeros and ones. Okay, so I can I can give you one example. Uh, I three D saves instruction set. Okay, instruction list. Um, 
in the instructions. It's BIOS, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't it BIOS? Okay, I just want to give you one particular example here. They are basically binary bit patterns, okay? They're binary bit patterns. And a part of the binary bit pattern specifies which register are we using. Are we doing okay so far? So let's say your original pro your processor has eight registers. Okay. Then when you add two numbers, you get to specify, okay, I want this to be to provide the first number, the first value to add, this register to provide the second value to add, and it's going to store back to the first one. Okay? Is that okay? So you take two and add those two registers together? Yeah, you, you add the values of the registers together and then you store it back into one of the two registers, okay? So one of the, those two has to be both the source and the destination of the addition operation, okay? But that's besides the point. But once you have that binary bit pattern dedicated to specify, add this register to that register, what happens? That becomes a part of the instruction set. Why is the instruction set important? The compiler cranks out code according to the instruction set. Right? Yes? Okay. Why do you think, hmm, let, me, let, me, let me think about this question a little bit. <coughs> How many platforms do you think Linux supports in terms of architectures, processor architectures? All modern architectures. There are some ancient ones that it does not support, but there's a lot. So let me just give you an idea of how many it does support. So Debian support architectures. Okay, you guys can count here. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14, well, okay, let's, let's just call it 14, okay? What about Microsoft Windows? For the most part, one, okay? And what is that? The x86 platform. They tried to do ARM, but that's kind of like a, you know, they, they, just, they just started to do that, right? But Linux has always been supporting at least this many architectures. And this is just Debian, too. It is not including some of the odd platforms <coughs> that some really oddball distribution supports. Okay? I mean, there are those. Okay? There, are, you know, there are unknown architectures, unknown to us, that are still supported by Linux. Why do you think that is the case? What happens here? They use Java. Hmm? Why don't they use Java a lot? No, 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 you don't, you never use Java in an operating system. That would be suicidal. <laughs> <laughs> Legacy hardware? Hmm? Legacy hardware. Legacy hardware, okay? You buy a i7 processor today, it is still binary code compatible with the 8086 processor. How old is the 8086 processor? 70s, exactly. So how many years have passed? 40, 30 years, 40 years. Okay. So what is what is the whole point here? <coughs> the instruction set of the x86 processor is assuming that you only have eight registers. Is that okay? If Intel says, hey, you know what? We have improved transistors these days to the point where we can have, I don't know, 64 registers easily, okay? And Intel says, I'm gonna change the instruction set to accommodate 64 registers. The instruction set itself has to change because before, in order to specify one of eight registers, how many bits do you need? Two to the power of what is three? Oops. <laughs> okay, crosswire. Two to the power of what is eight? <laughs> okay, burned out wire. Three. 
Okay, so you need three bits to specify which register you need out of eight. And the instruction set is dedicated, has hardwired and dedicated these three bits specify which register is going to be used as the first register. The other bits have other uses. They're already used up. You don't have any quote unquote spare bits left. Now you, you increase the number of registers to 64. How many bits do you need to specify one of 64 registers? Six bits. Where do you come up with those three other bits? You can't. You cannot do that without changing the instruction set itself. So this is the scenario. Intel says, <coughs> with the current generation of transistor design, 18 you know, uh, nanometer, we can easily pack 64, 64 bit registers into the processor. It will speed up you know, the, your code execution and stuff like that. It's great, okay? And then Microsoft is gonna come back and say what? Right? You cannot do that. Why, why can't, you know, Intel says, why can't I do this? This will make everything run faster. But Windows won't work anymore. Because Windows, all versions of Windows were compiled to run on what? The x86 architecture opcode. You change the opcode, it's not gonna run anymore. You lose backward compatibility. Okay, so here's the real question, okay? The real question is, how come Linux can support all of these architectures and it's not even a for-profit organization, as opposed to Microsoft, who only wants to use one single architecture. Why? What, what is the cost of supporting additional architectures? Well, time is one, but what kind of tool do you need in order to support multiple architectures? This comes from the CC++ class, you should know about this one. What is the tool that turns your CC++ compiler into a compiler? Okay, very good. So every compiler targets a particular architecture. Okay, you, even without knowing GCC manually, okay, uh, code blocks and, and the other IDEs, they use GCC in the back end. So they take your C and C++ code and they crank out whatever you know, our code crank up the crank up code for whatever architecture that it targets. So by changing the compiler, you can basically target your multiple you know, operating systems. So the limitation of Microsoft is they don't want to retarget their compiler. Okay, I think that is the first obstacle is they don't want to touch their compiler. Because compilers are not simple. Okay? They're actually pretty complicated software by itself so if you touch a compiler, you make it a cross target to another you know, architecture, it takes a little bit of time. It takes a lot, it takes you know, time and investment to, you know, to get it done. There's also a portion of code in an operating system that is not written in C or C++. It has to be written in assembly. So that part has to be manually you know, translated as well when you move from one architecture <coughs> to another architecture. Which basically means if Intel says, okay, here is this new super duper architecture, but it's not opcode compatible with the x86 architecture, Microsoft can respond with one of two options. One is telling Intel, if you do this, we are not gonna support you, okay? We'll tell all our vendors to use AMD processors. That's the first response. The second response is to go like, well, I guess that makes sense, and we'll just go back tell our software engineers to spend the next two years to retool everything so they can support the new architecture. Which option do you think Microsoft is going to take? Stay me all the way. The third option, they, they get to their legal counsel, you know, the lawyers first. They go, what should we do? The lawyer says, well, that's sui intel. <laughs> Because, you know, well, according to 20 years ago, we have a contract with Intel and we specify that they cannot change the opio. I'm just making this up. Okay, but that's the reason. That is the reason why, why Windows is still x86 only. And that is also the reason why we only have eight registers. Even though technology can easily support a lot more registers, 
the x86 instruction set is trapped. Well, there is no trap. The 64 bit instruction set does have additional registers. Okay? So, but, it's, but, but this is the thing. When you move from 32 bit instruction set to 64 bit instruction set, this, it's not backward compatible anymore because you're going forward. So, it's okay to do that. But you cannot change the architecture when it is not backward compatible anymore. Your i7 processor that you buy today can still run DOS 1.0 from way back when. <coughs> My question is, why? <laughs> you can do it in emulation. Okay? You can use the new processor to emulate any older processor. You can play Game Boy games faster than the original Game Boy using an emulator. So why do you want to lock down the processor architecture so that things have to, can be can continue to be backward compatible. That really is the question. Or it's probably for Microsoft. So if they can keep making it a lot only of benefits Microsoft. Intel doesn't benefit at all from this whole thing. It's something like we're we're trapped. So they want all the blue line. Yep. They want to say like no, can't change because it doesn't affect us. Yep. So that is, that is the reason why we only have limited number of registers. One, it is because of the physical limitation. We can only fit so many transistors on it. But the second and the more important reason is backward compatibility. Okay, the old instruction says only eight registers, then we only have eight registers. All right, are there any questions about this discussion? Okay. If there are no questions, I think we are Running out of time, so read a little bit ahead of me. I will be sure to go unlock you know, all of the uh, the pages, and then do your homework. And I'll see you guys on Thursday. Why am I no longer on the roster?